come now to the preaching of God's Word. And part of our worship is the uh, preaching of the Word of God. And we find ourselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, so we're on a serious break. We're studying Christian service, particularly uh, the spiritual gifts. And we examine Romans chapter 12, um, Ephesians chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4. So those are uh, the main uh, chapters or passages that we can study spiritual gifts. And, but the main uh, passages or chapters that really or that specifically speaks about uh, spiritual gifts is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. So we're done with chapter 12, and now we're in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. And today we want to consider verses 8 to the end of the chapter. So just to give you um, an overview, or uh, the main thing is this. Okay? Um, character um, triumphs spiritual gifts. God is interested in our sanctification, not with talents, uh, not with uh, spiritual gifts. And that is the main trust of um, chapter 13. That's the point of Paul for... Um, Emphasizing love in chapter 13. And so please stand. Let's read from uh, verse 8, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, verse 8 and um, to the end of the chapter. Verse 8, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also have been fully known. And verse 13, But now faith, hope, love abide this tree, but the greatest of the, this is love. You may now take your seat. So the title for our message this morning is The Reliability of Love, or The Permanence of Love, or The um, Priority of Love, or The Primacy of Love. And as we observe the world and the material aspect of it, we do understand that there is nothing absolutely permanent. We know that for sure. There's nothing permanent, absolutely permanent. Even the ungodly know that. And Apostle John even warned us or remind us not to love the world because the world is passing away. The world is passing away. People will fail us. And we will fail them. Relationships uh, come and go. Careers come and go. Health come and go. It, it wanes and it wax and ebbs and flow. And we do understand that. Money has limitation. Education has limitation. Our words are unreliable. Our words are sometimes untrue. I heard someone give an acronym to the word fine. You know, when you um, enter the church, how are you? I'm fine. And he said, uh, feelings inside never express. And, and that is true, right? Proverbs says, the intention of our hearts is like a deep water. We don't even understand ourselves at, at times. And Jeremiah said, our hearts is, what? Deceitful. Sometimes we're deceived by ourselves sometimes we betray ourselves you know life is full of uncertainty you know non-permanent here today and gone tomorrow but the bible speaks of love as permanent the bible speaks of love as permanent the virtue of chastity is long lasting and if there's one genuine uh, permanent thing it is love 
If, if you want to invest in something, you want to invest in love, which is permanent. If there is a sure and 100% fail proof, it is love. And if there is anything that we want to possess that is eternal, that you can have it now, and you can have it in eternity, and that is love. And that is why our election is based in what? Love, Ephesians chapter 1. Our salvation is motivated by love. For God so loved the world, He gave us His Son. Salvation is motivated by love. Our sanctification is to walk in love. Paul said, walk in love. And the picture of the church is marriage, husband and wife. Our calling is to love one another. And Romans chapter 8 tells us no one can separate us from the love of God. Because love is reliable. And I think Paul is emphasizing this in chapter 13 because the church at Corinth lacks nothing except love. They're gifted, uh, they're talented, but unloving. They focus on uh, temporal things. They, they center on um, earthly, unreliable things, and they end up sinning to one another and they brush sin under the rug. They, they um, overlook sin. They overlook unkindness. They tolerate impatience and even rude behavior. And we studied that, right? Rude in speech, rude in action, even rude in clothing. And so, and, and the church of Corinth overlooked that. Arrogance and selfishness, this pride, they, they tolerate unrighteousness. False doctrine and false uh, teachers. They tolerate homosexuality, divorce, and things like that. And so Paul needed to remind them of the importance of love and the permanence of love and the superiority of love. And if we want to serve the Lord in His church, if we want this church uh, to be faithful, and if we want to serve faithfully, we need to rely on love. So serving the Lord can be challenging. The church can be a place um, of envying and jealousy, a lot of quarreling, and uh, probably um, some of you have those experiences in churches. And we need, to, um, we need a lot of believing. Paul said, believe all things and hope all things and, and endure all things. We need a lot of that, and the virtue of love can help us serve with perseverance. And so to, um, to understand our text this morning, we need to look at four headings. Four headings. We see here the basic pattern of teaching, and these are not random comments from Paul. There is a structure we see here from uh, verses 8 to 13. And let me give you the first um, heading. First, in verse 8, you see Paul explained the uh, reliability of love in verse 8. So, First is explanation in verse 8. And second, he gives us the reason, verses 9 to 10. Third, uh, he gives illustration in verses 11 to 12. And then fourth, in verse 13, he gives conclusion. And so he explained, he gives the reason, he gives illustration, and then he concludes in verse 13. And so let's look at the first heading, explanation in verse 8. Paul said, love never fails. Let's stop there. So, the reliability of love begins with the statement, love never fails. Love never fails. Love will last in eternity because God is love. Love will never end because God is eternal. Now, to compare that with spiritual gifts, Paul said, prophecy Tongues and knowledge will be gone. It is non-permanent. It has an expiration. And I think Paul is giving the uh, Corinthian church and this church and all churches the proper perspective in Christian ministry. Because uh, usually we have wrong priorities. And they pray, we prioritize um, talents or spiritual gifts over love. You know, the Corinthian church, they prioritized 
popularity and prestige over love. And it led them to, again, envy and strife, division and jealousy. They fail in love because of their mindset, because of their earthly mindset. Now, what do we mean by um, love never fails in verse 8? If you look at that phrase again in verse 8, love never fails. It's some, in some translation, it says love never ends. The basic meaning of this word is to fall or falling, like falling from a higher place, like to fall down dead or to fall into a worse state. And so Paul is just saying here, love has no expiration date. It never fails. It never falls dead. It never falls to the ground. It never withers. It never decay. It never gone. That's love. But then we ask, in what sense that love never fails? In what sense? If we say love never fails, do we mean love is always successful? Do we mean love always wins? Since love never fails, are we guaranteed success when we love? Is it a success formula? Is it a spiritual um, magic formula that will, that will uh, really grant us a favorable result? Is that a formula to fulfill our desires since love never fails? And so, of course, we know that's not true. It's not an absolute guarantee to victory. Love does not always win. Love cannot always um, accomplish our purposes. No matter how loving, no matter how sincere, love does not guarantee success. You know, Judas betrayed Jesus despite of his what? Perfect love. True? He's the most loving person live on earth perfectly, but he was betrayed, he was rejected, and ridiculed, and even what? Crucified. However, church, whatever the Lord Jesus accomplished, he did it out of love, because no godly work can be fulfilled without love. One Bible teacher said, success will not always be a part of love, but love will always be a part of true spiritual success. So we need to remember we cannot please enough people. We cannot love them enough. We cannot care for them enough. That will not guarantee success. And so when Paul said uh, love never fails, he's not talking about success or even failure. It simply means love is permanent. It is the supreme characteristic of God. So listen, that's why Paul said love endures. Love persevere regardless of the outcome. And to make his point in verse 8, if you look at verse 8 again, he compared love with spiritual gifts. He said in verse 8, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. And so here in verse 8, we see how many spiritual gifts? The prophecy, tongue, knowledge, we see three spiritual gifts, right? And these are what? Is this a serving gifts or speaking gifts? These are speaking gifts, prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. These are speaking gifts, and these are the prominent gifts. Prominent in terms of its public presence. Prominent in terms of its influence. We influence people through our words, right? Speaking, in speech. But then Paul said it will be or it will disappear. He said it will cease. It will be done away. But love will continue. Now what do we mean by that? What do we mean by uh, these gifts being done away? What do we mean by that? If you look at verse 8 again, we are told that the gifts of prophecy and knowledge will be done away. And the gifts of tongue, they will cease. Now here we see um, two verbs. First is done away. Second is cease, right? See that? 
And so what do we mean by done away? You know, it simply means uh, to be terminated, abolish. The gifts of prophecy and knowledge will be totally gone. Second, what do we mean by the word cease? It means, simply means to stop. It, it almost has the same idea with done away. To abolish, to terminate, to stop. And so we ask, what's the difference between these two verbs? You see two verbs, right? Done away and cease. What, are, what is the difference? And the difference is in the voice. Let me explain that to you. Done away is in passive voice. Passive voice. And when we say passive voice, the action is done to you. Active voice is you're the one doing the action. And passive voice is the action. Um, you're receiving the action. The action is done to you. It means someone or something will cause the prophecy and knowledge to stop. Someone or something will cause the prophecy and knowledge to stop. Let's say you have a gift of prophecy. Let's say you have a gift of knowledge. Someone will, or something will cause that to stop. And as we see in, in our text in verse 10, if you look at verse 10, it says, It is when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. See that? On the other hand, the verb sees in verse 8 is in the middle voice. And so when we say middle voice, uh, means the action is done upon oneself. You do the action to yourself. In other words, the tongues, it will die itself. In other words, the tongues, it will self-terminate automatically. It, automatically, it will stop. The cause of stopping comes from within. You know, like a 10-year non-removable battery of a smoke alarm. You know that, right? You don't have to replace the battery. It will just die. It has a life expectancy. Tongues will cease of themselves. It will stop automatically. Whereas prophecy and knowledge, it has... Um, it needs someone or something to stop. Now the question is when. When the gifts ended, Paul did not say when for the tongue. He didn't mention that. He didn't say when for the tongue. And so we need to accept uh, that there is no explicit statement when the, the gift of tongue um, ended. We don't have an explicit statement here. When we know that it will cease, but we don't know when. And so we don't have that explicit statement. We don't have also um, an explicit statement that the tongue has continued to this day. No clear date. We just know it will cease. But the burden of proof is on those who say it continued. You get that? The burden of, because the Bible is clear that the tongue will cease. We just don't know when. But the burden of proof is on to those who say it continued. It is clear in our text that tongues will cease. Now Paul mentioned when for the prophecy in tongues, or sorry, prophecy in knowledge. He said when, and that is in verse 10. He said when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. But even that, there's no exact date or time frame, right? He just said, you know, it will stop when the perfect comes. And because of this, brothers and sisters, there are two theological disagreements. Because of this, and there are the, um, you're familiar, maybe you're familiar with the term cessationist and the continuationist, right? What do we mean by that? Well, uh, cessationism, as the name suggests, believes the miraculous gifts, tongues, healing have ceased at the end of the apostolic era. The cessationist believes that God still does miracle, God still performs miracle and healings to this day, but the Holy Spirit no longer uses individual, no longer uses um, you know, people to perform miraculous gifts. Such as tongues, healing, signs, and wonder. 
So maybe you're familiar with the, uh, uh, with, with the uh, prosperity preachers and teachers, you know, Benny Heen and Kenneth Copeland. And so they believe that they have these gifts of healing. And so the cessationists don't believe, don't believe that. We believe God does miracle healing, but we don't believe that um, the Holy Spirit um, empowers a person to perform uh, such miracles and healing. Now, of course, the uh, continuationist, as the name suggests, believes the flip side of that. And so the, the continuationism is the belief that all the spiritual gifts, including tongues and miracles and healings, are still in operation today. And so probably here in, in Swift, uh, there are churches who believe that. Um, I think I, you know, I counted maybe four. I don't know. There's a lot of churches here. They explicitly say that you, know, you need to have these miracles and healings and tongues. They believe that these gifts are still in operation to this day. In other words, some people are gifted with healing to this day. Some people are gifted with doing miracles to this day and even tongue speaking. And we will talk about that in chapter 14. Now, I know this subject is um, controversial. I don't know what you believe. There's a lot of things needed to explain regarding this topic. And this subject alone deserves its own sermon series. And we will do that next time. In the meantime, let me tell you what I believe. In the meantime, let me tell you where I stand on this issue. I believe that miraculous gifts, tongues, gifts of healing, etc. have ceased. God can perform miracles, I believe that, and healings anytime He wants. Anytime He wants. But I think He no longer uses anyone, anyone, to perform those things. Listen to my proposed statement of faith. I'm going to quote from um, my proposed um, statement of faith. Quote, we believe and teach in this respect that God the Holy Spirit is sovereign in the bestowing of all His gifts for the perfecting of the saints today and that speaking in tongues and the working of signs miracle in the beginning days of the church were for the purpose of pointing to and authenticating the apostles as revealers of divine truth and were never intended to be characteristic of all believers or normative in the church age. All the biblical miraculous signs, gifts have ceased. We believe and teach that there were two kinds of gifts given to the early church, miraculous gifts of divine revelation and healing given temporarily in the apostolic era for the purpose of confirming and authenticating of the apostle's message. And ministering gifts given to equip believers for edifying one another with the New Testament revelation now complete, confirming gifts of miraculous nature are no longer necessary. We believe and teach that no one possesses the gifts of healing today but that God does hear and answer the prayer of faith and will answer in accordance with His own perfect will for the sick, suffering, and afflicted. In addition, we believe and teach that the gift of prophecy in the sense of receiving new revelation directly from God, the gift of tongues, the gift of the interpretation of tongues have all ceased. However, we acknowledge that miraculous gifts can be counterfeited by Satan so as to deceive even believers. The only gifts in operation today are the non-revelatory equipping gifts given for edification. In the last paragraph, we believe that the gift of tongues was the miraculous God-given capacity to communicate the truth of God's word in human languages the speaker had never learned or studied. It was a manifestation of God's power and blessing to validate the gospel message the apostle taught and to establish the early church. 
We believe that ecstatic outbursts and private prayer languages share nothing in common with the New Testament gift of tongues and that they are patently unbiblical. And so that's what I believe. And that's what I teach. Now that's to um, you know, segue a little bit with this um, doctrine, the continuationist and the uh, cessationist. But we don't want to go deep into that subject. So I just want to let you know what I believe and teach regarding this subject. Now to go back to our text, Paul explains the uh, reliability of love. That's his point here. That love never fails. Spiritual gifts has limitation. It will cease. It will be done away. And now we move to the reason why. In our second heading. In verses 9 to 10, we see the reason. So explanation, and then he goes to reason in verse 9. Look at verse 9 and 10. He said, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. And so here in verses 9 to 10, we see the reason why love is permanent and spiritual gifts are not. Notice Paul didn't give the reason again for the gift of tongues. Why? Because again, tongue has a, a built-in expiration, doesn't have to explain it. It will stop itself and no need further explanation. But for the prophecy and knowledge, there's a reason. You see here in verse 10, he said again, uh, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Now, if you look at verse 9, uh, Paul said, um, we know in part, right? And we prophesy in part. And so Paul even includes himself. We, including himself. He said we. Even the apostles knew in part. Uh, even the apostles, they prophesied in part. Even uh, they have limitation. And that's why we are warned, if you can turn your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We are warned by this in chapter 8. Verse 2 to 3, Paul said, uh, If anyone, including himself, if anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. And so even Paul um, li has limitation. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. And so we are warned by that. We can only prophesy in part. We know in part. Now Paul said, it will be done away. He said uh, again in verse, um, verses 9 to 10, when the perfect comes. And so what do we mean by that? When the perfect comes. What do we mean by that? So, so there are three interpretations offered. First, uh, the perfect comes means when the scripture is completed. Genesis to Revelation. Now the problem with that interpretation, and so they're saying uh, this phrase, when the perfect comes, is the... Uh, completion of the, uh, of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But the, the problem of this interpretation, it doesn't match the illustration in verse 12. If you look at verse 12, it says there, uh, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. It kind of didn't match the illustration. And so one Bible teacher said, quote, Scripture gives a wonderful and reliable picture of God, but it does not allow us to see Him face to face. Do you get that? And so the Scripture can give us pictures about God, but it's different when we see Him face to face. And so even if we have the complete Scripture, and it gives us a picture of God, but it's different if we see him face to face. And so the perfect comes is not the completion of scripture. Meaning to say we have to wait until we meet him face to face. Even if we have the completed scripture from Genesis to Revelation, it's going to be different when we see the Lord face to face. And so even if to, as of today, we have a complete, Completed scripture, we have the full canon, uh, but that doesn't mean that the, uh, the prophecy and knowledge cease. 
Now, second is, uh, since Paul uses the uh, illustration of a child turning into a man in verse 11, if you look at verse 11, and so some suggested that the perfect comes, the phrase perfect comes, is the maturing or completion of the church. You know, when the church is complete or mature, or perfect, the gifts will be done away. And that makes sense since the purpose of the gifts is to what? Is to edify the church. That's the purpose of the gift, to edify one another. The church is not a building. The church is us. It's you. And so when the perfect or the maturity, maturity of the church um, is completed, and then the uh, gifts of prophecy and knowledge will be done away. Therefore, we don't need the gifts anymore. If the church is mature, completed, we don't need the gifts anymore. That makes sense. But the question is, uh, here's the question, when will that happen? Right? Is it on the rapture of the church? But that cannot be since the gifts are still present in the tribulation and the millennial kingdom. So if you believe in a, a pre-trib rapture, um, after the rapture, seven years tribulation, and then 1,000 uh, years of reign. And so after the rapture, there's still gifts. That's the point. And so the completion of the church doesn't match that. Now, what do we mean by the completion of the church? Do we mean, is it on the second coming of Christ? That cannot be either since there are going to be extensive proclamation of God's word when Christ returned. And so we still need the gifts of prophecy. We still need the gifts of knowledge when Christ returned because there will be a proclamation of God's word when Christ returned. And so we still need that gift. Listen to Jeremiah 23 verse 4. I will also raise up shepherds over them and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any, any be missing, declares the Lord. So that's a prophecy in the millennium. In Isaiah 11, 9, They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So there's going to be the gift of preaching and teaching, um, now and even in Christ's return. When the Lord returns, they're going to be preaching and teaching of God's word. Therefore, we still need the gift of these gifts. Now, so what do we mean by when the perfect comes? So when the perfect comes, it's not the uh, completion of the scripture. Um, the perfect comes, it's not the, uh, the completion of the church. And the completion of the church is not the rapture. It's not the second coming of Christ, but the perfect comes is, um, so what we have here, the final option is the um, final consummation of all things. That's the, the main option that we have. It is the perfect eternal state. When everything is all done, after the second coming, after the resurrection and the final judgment day, it is at the end uh, that Paul said here that the partial will cease. The imperfect spiritual gifts on earth will be done away. That is in the final stage or consummation of all things. And that is when we enter the perfect state of knowledge at the end of consummation. But Paul said love will never end. Love will never fail. It will never cease. And so spiritual gifts... Uh, the prophecy and knowledge will cease at the final eternal state, but love will continue. Love will never cease. It will continue. Evangelism will end. The preaching of God's word will end. We no longer need that someday in heaven. We don't evangelize people in heaven. That's crazy. But love is permanent. We're not Mormons. We don't have an evangelism of the dead. Now, Paul gives us illustration here in verses 11 to 12. And so first, he gave an explanation in verse 8, and then he gives us the reason in verses 9 to, uh, 9 to 10, and then illustration in verses 11 to 12. Look at verses 11 to 12, the illustration. There are two illustrations we see here. 
First, in verse 11, we see the illustration of the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. Paul said in verse 11, When I was a child, I used to speak like a child. Speak like a child. That's prophecy. That's that illustration for prophecy. Think like a child. Reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish, childish uh, things. And so the illustration is simple. One moment he was a boy, the next he was a man. And Paul is saying here simply, nothing wrong with child speaking childish things. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with a child um, thinking like a child or reasoning like a child. There's nothing wrong with that. But when a child became a man or a woman, childish, uh, childish things must be done away, must go away. All immaturity, all imper imperfections and, and limitation must be done away. The former uh, way of thinking, the inadequate um, reasoning must be done away. And so the same is true with the gift of prophecy. It is momentarily. Reality of prophecy is, uh, is passing. Someday we will put prophecy away. So that's the first illustration. The second illustration is about knowledge. If you look at verse 12, For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part. So that's the illustration for knowledge. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. And the idea here is about the vague a reflection versus reality. Now, uh, if you're using King James Version, um, they translated this word mirror into glass. Glass. Some translations use glass instead of mirror. And the idea is we look through a glass, like a glass window glass. Like that window. It's, it's dim and the, the object is different if you look at, um, if you look at through a window uh, compared to looking at the, the object face to face. So that's the idea of the glass. Now if you want to go with the mirror analogy, it has the same idea, right? Sometimes you look, um, you look different in a mirror. Sometimes you look um, a little maybe wider, I don't know, in a mirror. And there's a, you know, uh, in a side mirror, there's a safety warning, right? Safety warning. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. And of course, in ancient time, mirrors were imperfect polished metal, and the reflection is vague and obscure. So that's the main point. Whether you're using um, translation or um, a translation word of mirror as glass, looking through a glass mirror window, or sorry, a window glass or mirror, it has the same idea. Reflection is vague and obscure. And Paul is using that analogy to make his point about the momentary and passing away of gifts. When we see the Lord face to face in verse 12. But love is permanent when we see him face to face. And so the gifts of prophecy and knowledge right now is, is partial. It's vague. It, it has limitation. It will be done away when we see the Lord face to face. When we see the Lord face to face. And that's why Paul is saying here, don't, don't focus on spiritual gifts. We need that. He said that in, 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 in chapter 14. He said, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. We want that. We need that to edify one another. But the priority is love. That's his point. Priority is love. Why? Because love is eternal. Love is permanent. The love is greater when we are with Christ face to face. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter 1.8. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. How much more when we see him, right? We're going to be different. In our present state, we are incapable of comprehending um, you know, the scripture, we have limitation in comprehending. We lack the ability to understand. We have lots of questions. We have lots of doubts, right? 
In the meantime, and that's why we have spiritual gifts, because we have a lots of questions. We need spiritual gifts to what? To teach one another, to edify one another, to help one another. But then, when the perfect comes, we don't need that anymore. We don't need that anymore. We don't need spiritual gifts in the future when we see the Lord face to face. That's why Paul said in verse 12, Then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. So, now conclusion in verse 13. Conclusion in verse 13. Paul explains it. Uh, he gives us the reason. He illustrated it. And now he gives conclusion. Look at verse 13. But now faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of this is love. And so Paul emphasizes the virtue of love. Love triumphs spiritual gifts. Character is more important than spiritual gifts. Character. Love is the most godlike character. Now, if you observe a little bit verse 13, Paul did not just compare love with spiritual gifts. That is in verses 8 to 12. He compared love with spiritual gifts. You know what? Here in verse 13, he compared love with what? With other virtues. You see that? He compared love with other virtues. Even with other virtues, love is, is superior. Love is not only greater than spiritual gifts, but it's also greater than all spiritual virtues. Why? Because love is the summary of all virtues. Love surrounds faith and hope. That's why Paul said, um, where is that? Love hopes all things and believes all things. Love surrounds other virtues. Love covers all virtue because love is the summary of all virtues. And so if we have a problem with love, it's because we fail in faith, it's because we fail in joy, we fail in peace, we fail in patience and long-suffering, we fail in that, and that's why we're not loving. Love is the summary of all virtues. Why? Because God is love. God doesn't need faith. Does he need faith? No. We need faith. He doesn't need faith. God doesn't need hope. Faith and hope will have no purpose in heaven. Do you need faith and hope in heaven? No. But you need love. We don't need faith and hope and spiritual gifts in heaven. We don't need that anymore. But we need love. Love is the greatest because love is eternal. Faith will cease. Hope will cease. Patience will cease. But love remains. And so if we want this church to be God's church, we need to uh, cultivate the virtue of chastity. We need to cultivate, we need to focus ourselves and cultivate the virtue of love. That's what we need. Not only in church, we begin in, at home, right? We begin there. Because the church is the gathering of people, family, relationship in, that started in the home. Now let me remind you, when I say love, I don't mean the romantic, sentimental feeling, goosebumps love. I don't mean that. That's not biblical love. What I mean by love is this. Look at verse 4 again. What is love? Love is patient. Love is kind. What love is not, it's not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It's not easily provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. It not, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. What, what love can do, it can rejoice with the truth. What love can do, it can bear all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endure all things. And what else? Love never fails. And so we can rely on love. It's reliable. It outlasts everything. And so if this is crucial in our church life, if this is crucial in your home, 
It should be. If love is a vital in Christian home, Christian service, if love is reliable, the question is, how do we cultivate this? Do you know? How do we cultivate love? Watch movie? Uh, watch um, Titanic? No. How do we cultivate this? So we talk about that next week. And so next week we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the refinement towards love. And that is very important. We, we want that. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for um, your word uh, this morning. It's simply telling us that love is reliable. And we are glad to know that. And love cannot be the separated from truth. We need to uh, be in truth in love. We live in a time today that people are moving away from, from the truth. And we cannot know the perfect love. We cannot know the, um, even the meaning of love away from God's word. And so help us, O oh Lord, um, w- with this virtue. Increase our love. Love for you, love for your church, and love for the lost. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.